Well, it's indeed a, a pleasure to welcome everyone uh, to our first plenary session of our annual meeting, the third John B. Little Legacy Plenary Lecture. Dr. Little's pioneering studies were focused on the mutagenic and carcinogenic effects of ionizing radiation in cells directly targeted by radiation. Later, Dr. Little discovered what, what has become known as non-targeted biological effects of radiation exposure, including radiation-induced genomic instability. He was the founder of the radiation biology program at the Harvard School of Public Health and the visionary leader for their radiation biology training program, which began in 1975. Dr. Little was a past president of the Radiation Research Society and recipient of its Fiela Award. Dr. Little also received the Henry S. Kaplan Distinguished Scientist Award from the International Association for Radiation Research. A truly international figure in the field of radiation biology, Dr. Little is widely respected and cited for his intellectual accomplishments, mentoring skills, and collegial leadership. Please join me in watching this short legacy video. Jack Little, an extraordinary man from Massachusetts. Jack really wanted to be in the spotlight. Jack was much more comfortable empowering those around him. Jack's daily work in the laboratory has led to over 500 scientific publications. We in the radiation research community thank Jack for his countless contributions and mentoring of several generations of radiation biologists. It's my real pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished speaker for today's plenary lecture, Dr. Judith Campisi. She received her PhD in biochemistry from the State University of New York at Stony Brook and completed her postdoctoral training in cell cycle regulation and cancer biology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical Center. As an associate and then assistant and then associate professor at Boston University Medical School, she studied the role of cellular senescence in suppressing cancer and soon became convinced that senescent cells also contributed to aging. She joined the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory as a senior scientist. And then in 2002, she started a second laboratory at the Buck Institute of Aging, where she is currently a professor. Dr. Campisi, established a comprehensive research program to understand the relationship between aging and age-related diseases like cancer with an emphasis on the role of cellular senescence in promoting inflammation and degenerative diseases. Dr. Campisi is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science. She's re received numerous awards, many, much too many to um, outline all of them here, but they include two merit awards from the National Institute of Aging and awards from the Allied Signal Corporation, the Gerontological Society of America and the American Federation for Aging Research. She is a recipient of the Longevity Prize from the Ibsen Foundation, and she is the first recipient of the International Olaf Thon Foundation Prize in National Science and Medicine. Dr. Campisi currently serves on many advisory committees, um, including the Alliance for Aging Research, the Progeria Research Foundation, and NIA's Intervention and Testing Program. She's on editorial boards for more than a dozen uh, peer-reviewed journals, and she's the scientific founder of Unity Biotechnology, a California-based company focused on developing therapies for age-related pathologies. So with that, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Campisi to the Radiation Research Society. And Judy, we really look forward to your presentation this morning. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Susan. Really, this is a pleasure. And I, I feel a little bit intimidated since I'm following this uh, session before me, where a lot of the important points were already made up. If we could, let's see, do I need to share my screen de novo? Yes, I do. Yes, I believe that's right. Yes, and we can see it, so thank you. So, 
disclosure, I'm, I'm not going to be talking about, about unity, but the principle of trying to eliminate senescent cells dominates the company as it did the last century. So let me start though with aging. I, I started life studying cancer, but really if you start with aging, you realize of course no one dies of good health. We all die of these horrible diseases and they're really different. There are those that are affect mostly post-mycotic cells, those that affect mitotic cells. Um, there's, of course, cancer. All of these are age-related diseases, and they have something in common that is striking. Extremely rare in young people, and then around 50 to 60 years of age, in the case of people, a year and a half and many months, all of these diseases rise with approximately exponential genetics. So those of us who work on aging are convinced this is not a coincidence. We think that there must be some basic aging processes that are driving all of these diseases. And we think now that there's evidence that cellular senescence is a good candidate for such a disease. So I think you've heard from um, the speakers in the you know, uh, previous session the definition of senescence. I want to make two points in emphasizing how we recognize a senescent cell. So the first is that there's this tripartite phenotype, including this irreversible growth arrest, which several speakers have emphasized, prevents cancer, this multifactorial secretory phenotype, which I'll tell you more about, but also this resistance to apoptosis, which was emphasized as a possible target for therapy. I want to show you though that all of these are very plastic phenotypes. So let me start with what is it that would drive a cell to adopt these three parts of the phenotype. And of course, the first is anything that damages the genome or the epigenome. And of course, radiation is very, very high on that list. But even spontaneous mutations and oncogenes or metabolic balances that we don't often associate with genomic damage, for example, high glucose or advanced glycation end products, when these accumulate, they can drive cells into this uh, phenotype, which we now believe is a major cause of many age related diseases. But there is another way we have to remember, and this was again alluded to by several of the speakers, we have to remember that this phenotype was under evolutionary pressure. And evolution did not induce this uh, phenotype in order to prevent or drive aging. There was no aging for 90 plus percent of our evolutionary history. So, the evolutionary pressure, of course, was to suppress cancer that had to be done in young people in order for them to reproduce. But we now know that especially the secretory phenotype is important for certain structures in the embryo. It's important for inducing labor. And this is usually due to some of the bioactive lipids that senescent cells produce. And then finally, as it was alluded to, by several of the speakers, the secretory phenotype contributes to tissue repair in return. So this is the way we need to think about senescence, is that it's an evolutionary balancing act. There are things that the senescent cells do that are, are beneficial, and there are things that senescent cells do that are deleterious. And the big challenge for the future is going to be to preserve the good aspects and try to eliminate or at least alleviate um, what we know the deleterious effects of connecting cells are. So let me start though by talking about um, senescent biomarkers. So many labs have gone on a hunt for senescent biomarkers. I just suggest a few here. Many of them are um, focused on what the cells secrete, which are very complicated mixtures, and I'll 
again, talk more about that. I should point out that um, we tend to think about these fever factors as coming in two main flavors, and I'll describe to you why we think they differ. But the main point is absolutely none of these markers are, to my knowledge, senescent specific. And I predict we will never have a truly senescent specific marker. And so it's a challenge for the field because in order to have some confidence that a cell is indeed senescent, we typically have to look at, at multiple markers. But nonetheless, using these markers, many labs have now asked, when and where do you find senescent cells in vivo? And there are two answers. The first is they absolutely increase with age. To my knowledge, this is true for virtually every vertebrate species that has been examined. And it's probably also going to be true for some complex invertebrate species like Drosophila, where in the gut there may be an accumulation of senescent cells. And I'll remind you the gut is maybe the only tissue in Drosophila that shows anything that looks a little bit like cancer, the stuff type of proliferation. Um, but every tissue that has been examined shows increased senescence um, with age. And what I'm showing you here at the bottom panel is normal human skin. The top two panels are young skin, the bottom four are older skin. And you can see this is the senescence associated beta galactosidase, but you can see that there are very few in the young skin and the old they're present in both the epidermis and the dermis. I do want to point out that the right hand panel, this is unusual to see tracks of senescent cells. I'll come back to that in a moment. And the next panel is, of course, uh, this is from Claudio Torres's lab. Uh, he looked at autopsy materials and brains of cognitively normal and aged mass patients with Alzheimer's disease, and you can see there are senescent markers in the Alzheimer's brain, and they're mostly in the astrocytes, which is not a surprise given what we heard this morning. And the other point is that if you look at age-related disease and you compare disease tissue with age-matched non-disease tissue, Frequently, there are more senescent cells in the disease tissue. And I've listed just some of these tissues here. For example, in arthritic joints, osteoarthritic joints, so that's the age related osteoarthritis, there are more senescent chondrocytes in an osteoarthritic joint than in a joint that is not arthritic, but is age So, this is pretty interesting. It is consistent with the fact that senescent cells could be driving aging and age-related disease. But this is a bit of a conundrum. There are almost never um, a majority of senescent cells in any tissue. In fact, some of the reports that show 40, 50% senescent cells are probably artifacts um, due to not looking at multiple senescent cells. So most um, clear, uh, attempts to quantify senescent cells in especially human tissue, but even mouse tissue, they're on the order of a few percent. And this then raises another challenge, which is, okay, the cells are kind of a smoking gun, they're present at the right time and the right place to be driving aging and many age-related diseases, but how could they do it? if they're at such a low level. And then, of course, the important question is, do they actually do anything? Because up until very recently, we've mostly had this correlative data, which, of course, does not prove causality. So let me first address the question of how, um, which I think will come as no surprise to many of you. And then I'll address the question of, do they do anything? So this is how we think anyway. We're pretty convinced that many of the diseases and phenotypes that are driven by senescent cells 
is due to what is secreted by those cells. And as I told you, we tend to bin them into two main categories. So the first, I think most of you are familiar with, um, this, these are um, genes that are induced usually in a P53 independent manner, but these genes are induced at the level of transcription and the proteins that they encode, code for things like pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, but also things like growth factors, proteases, and very recently even uh, bioactive lipids that we think may be driving uh, some of the phenotypes associated with senescence. The other module is really largely independent of transcription. This is, these are often missed when we do whole uh, or single cell sequencing or whole genome sequencing. Um, but these tend to be P53 dependent and they're typified by this protein called HMGB1. HMGB1 is a major nuclear protein. It's an organizer of the nucleus. And at senescence, it frequently leaves the nucleus and is secreted outside where it has a totally different function, and that is to function as a damp, as a damage-associated molecular pattern. And that then sets the stage for the immune system to begin to respond to senescent cells. But of course, what both of these arms have in common is that they can drive inflammation. And I just will remind you that many, many years ago, Claudio Franceschi coined this term inflammation to describe how a pathologist could easily tell, say, a biopsy of the same tissue from a young person and an old person, and that would be to look for low-level chronic inflammation. It's been known for years that chronic inflammation can eventually destroy tissues, especially the innate immune system, because the innate immune system, of course, drives um, uh, produces many toxic molecules because their first job is to kill an invading pathogen. So they produce oxidative damage through hydrogen peroxide, nitric oxide, bleach, etc. But even these cytokines can disrupt normal cells from functioning. They can prevent stem cells from functioning. And of course, Inflammation is a major risk factor for the development of cancer, especially age-related cancer. On the other hand, I will remind you, you will never repair a wound or a tissue without at least an initial, if not transient, inflammatory response. So this is all consistent with senescent cells having both this good function and these deleterious functions. And I just want to end by saying that we do call this sort of inflammation plus because it's extremely complex, the secretory phenotype, and it probably has functions above and beyond driving inflammation. And we're still exploring and, um, and uh, discovering new functions that uh, the secretory phenotype might confer. Okay, so last year, in, in collaboration with um, Birgit Schilling, who is our mass spec guru at the Buck Institute, and driven largely by uh, Nate Basiski, who now has his own lab at the National Institute on Aging, uh, we did a very comprehensive analysis, mass spec analysis, unbiased mass spec analysis of the secretory phenotype. Now, everything I'm showing you on this slide were hu normal human fibroblasts in culture. And I'll show you um, other cells from other tissues. But if you just look at this simple cell type in culture, induced to senesce by different means, so we use X irradiation, or we use an oncogene, in this case, oncogenic grass, or we use this drug called adesanavir which like radiation is often used to treat a disease, but in this case, it's HIV AIDS. It's a protease inhibitor. Um, you can see that there's a huge number of proteins that are secreted as both soluble forms, but also in exosomes. And if we try to overlap these uh, profiles with each other, there is overlap. 
But you can also see that each inducer has its own peculiar um, features. And this is both good news and bad news. So the good news is we think that by understanding these unique features, we might be able to get at the big unanswered question in aging research, which is how do cells become senescent during normal aging? What are the drivers? Is it genomic damage? Is it mitochondrial dysfunction? Um, is it just oxidative stress? We don't know. And we're hoping these signatures will help us understand that. And the other thing about this core is that we collaborated with Luigi Ferrucci at the National Institutes on Aging, who is looking at plasma from patients throughout the, the age. So he has this Baltimore longitudinal study. So he was able to look over the age span of humans. And there is a core of SAS factors that overlaps with some of the factors that he sees associated with aging from humans, human plasma. Now here's again, part of the complications and why so much more work is needed. This is an old slide, this is my goodness. 2008, this was before we had good unbiased mass spec. This work was done primarily by um, John Philippe Coppe in collaboration with Pete Nelson at the Fred Hodge. Uh, Pete was looking at a uh, prostate, human prostate, and what he did was he isolated fibroblasts and epithelial cells from the same organ, in this case, prostate. And this is also now the same genotype. So I'm showing you one person, this fibroblast and epithelium from the same tissue. And then Jean-Philippe made them all senescent by X-ray radiation. And then he asked, what are they secreted? So here are the various proteins that are detected by antibodies on this antibody array. And what you can see is that there are things in common between the stroma and the epithelium, but then there are things that are stromal specific, and then there are things that are epithelial specific. And we have now done this for a, more than almost a dozen different human cell types, and we see the same thing. There are specific signatures for specific cell types. And even when we use more sophisticated techniques like RNA-seq, again, for example, human astrocytes and fibroblasts, there's only about 50% overlap. And although we love the mouse and we do work with mice, there are species specific differences and mice are not humans and humans are not mice. So there's lots and lots of variation that needs to be considered when we do our experiments. Um, as I mentioned, we are pretty sure that the secretory phenotype depends on how cells become senescent to begin with. So we can do that in culture very easily. We don't know in vivo, but in culture we've done this and we do. So I'm just listing here four main ways of inducing senescence in culture. And I've just um, color coded the pattern of the secretory phenotype that each inducer results in. And as you can see, there are things in common with all the inducers, but then there are things that are absolutely specific to one specific inducer. And so again, um, we don't know in vivo what this means, but we're beginning to get hints that will tell us how different inducers might drive different phenotypes and might also help explain some of the extreme variability and heterogeneity in aging phenotypes and also in cancer. So the last point I want to make is um, that this secretory phenotype is not static. And I'm showing you an example of two genes and how they're induced. Again, these are human fibroblasts induced by X-ray radiation and we're looking at the expression of a gene, ALOX5, which codes for a pro-fibrotic leukotriene. And you can see there's a huge induction very early on. It then declines. It then rises again, but then eventually it goes back down almost to zero. Very different from the induction of this gene, which codes for an anti-fibrotic prostaglandin. And you can see that the 
the uh, dynamics are extremely different. And this turned out to be important when we collaborated with Claude Lasso at UCSF. And I should point out most of this work was done by Chris Wiley, who now has his own lab at Tufts University. Um, we looked at fiber, lung fibroblasts from patients who were wild type and from patients who had idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And when we induce senescence in these fibroblasts, we can see that the pro-fibrotic leukotriene is induced to spine. But if you look at the induction of this anti-fibrotic prostaglandin, it's deficient in the patient of fibroblasts. And so we are tempted to conclude that this may be part of the reason why fibrosis accumulates in the lungs of these patients. Now, I also will point out that's not on the slide is that we now have looked months, months after inducing senescence, either by radiation or an oncogene, doesn't matter. Um, this pattern of secreted factors still changes. And some of you may be aware of the fact that there have been a couple of labs now that have looked at the reactivation of retroposons in senescent cells. John Sedeby's lab and Vera Gorbanova's lab and again, this happens quite late, many weeks, months after the cells become senescent. So this is a constantly changing pattern that we now know. Now, all of this um, is interesting. It shows that there are lots of candidates of things that could be doing um, pro-aging or pro-cancer phenotypes, but do they actually do anything? I'm gonna show you just two old experiments um, that gave us an early indication that they do do something. And the first was done by Simona Paranello, who's now at the University College London. She's got a named chair there. Um, she was looking at a three-dimensional culture of um, murine breast cells that were, so you put them in culture as single cells, they grow and they make these beautiful alveoli, and then you add lactogenic hormones and they make milk. So here the red color is beta casein. And if you embed in these cultures, non-senescent mammary fibroblasts, you still get these beautiful alveoli and lots of milk. And if the mammary fibroblasts are senescent, these alveoli are often misshapen and milk production falls. And the second set of experiments were done by Anna Kutolika and again, jean philippe Coffey. Um, you're looking at, uh, on the left, tumor size over time of a pre-malignant breast epithelial cell line injected directly into the breast. And these are pre-malignant cells, so they don't form tumors unless you co-inject with senescent fibroblasts. And this is in an immune competent mouse. Now, Jean-Philippe did this with human breast cancer cells in an immune compromised mouse. And you can see that senescent fibroblasts increase tumor size and also increase the vasculature. Um, senescent cells produce a lot of dead gap and these cells will metastasize, whereas these cells will not. So the idea was is that senescent cells might be driving um, changes in phenotype and, and changes in cancer behavior. And we decided to try to test this in a whole mouse model. And so this is our, um, our P16 3MR mouse model. It's very similar to the model that was made by the Mayo Clinic, Jan van Dursen's lab and Jim Kirkland's lab. In which case we both took example, uh, advantage of the P16 gene. So again, I wanna emphasize this only measures P16 positive cells. Uh, in our case, we used a transgene, so there's no interruption of the endogenous P16 gene. But what we've done is have the promoter drive this artificial gene that allows us to follow the cells by luciferase, sort them by red fluorescent protein, but most importantly, kill them by virtue of this viral thymidine kinase, which converts this prodrug into a um, potent DNA chain terminator 
Senescent cells, of course, don't replicate nuclear DNA, but they do replicate mitochondrial DNA. So this gets into the mitochondria, fragments the mitochondrial genome, and the cells die by apoptosis. And I should also point out this mouse was part of a program project grant uh, in collaboration with Jan Bij, Jan Fremachers, and Paul Hasty. And a lot of its characterization was done by Marco uh, De Maria, who now has his own lab at Groningen. So between our mouse and uh, the male mouse, we've shared our mice with many, many academic labs that are um, studying different age-related diseases. And I've just, I've stopped keeping track of the list because the list, every few weeks, there's another disease that's added. And what these papers show is that if you eliminate senescent cells, you can either delay the onset, ameliorate the severity, or even in some cases reverse the pathology of these diseases, at least in a mouse. So let me show you, um, this was shown a little bit uh, by Del Hong. I'll go through it very quickly, but this was Marco's uh, work where he looked primarily at the effect on cancer. So what Marco did was he treated our mice with a single dose of these different cytotoxic or genotoxic uh, chemotherapy agents, as well as radiation. Radiation did the same thing. And he asked what happens, what's the cost of having this burden of senescent cells? And he used this, to do this, he used a, a breast cancer cell line labeled with a different lucifrase. This is firefly. And these cells were known to metastasize to the lung and the liver. So the idea is we gave, he gave the animal breast cancer, waited a few days, treated them with a genotoxic agent, in this case, Dr. Lubison, but as I said, radiation will do the same thing, and then either treat it with gancyclovir or not. So here's the control mouse, here's the primary tumor, here's the metastasis to the liver and the lung, and here are the animals treated with gancyclovir. So first thing to note, is we have very variable effects on the primary tumor. We still don't completely understand that. We're still working on that. But what we've done is completely eliminate the ability of the cells to, um, to grow as metastases. And our hypothesis is that this is due to the fact that we've eliminated the secretory phenotype that sets the stage from this, for metastatic take as well as metastatic growth. Um, drugs like um, Dr. Lubison also cause heart problems. You can measure, this is a collaboration with uh, Simon Meloff at the Buck. It causes a decline in ejection fraction and fraction of shortening. And if we add gancyclovir immediately after the drug, we prevent that decline in heart function. And the drugs like Dr. Lubison also cause blood clots which again, we can easily measure in a mouse. Um, and you can see that the drug causes a pro-clotting phenotype, which can be completely eliminated by uh, treating the animals with gancyclovir. So what this argues is that these, um, the accumulation of senescent cells in response to genotoxic agents, including radiation, uh, can be largely ameliorated by eliminating senescent cells. And this is sort of the one two punch that uh, Dao Hong referred to as being um, somewhat uh, um, advantageous. Now, I do want to point out something though. If we wait too long, if we wait until after heart failure occurs or until after blood clots form and then eliminate senescent cells, there's no benefit. So this is amelioration, but it's not reversal. But the next example I'll show you is an example of reversal. And this is a collaboration with Jennifer Ulysses. And most of the work was done by Oki Jian, who now has her own lab in Korea. Um, so Jennifer works in a model of injury-induced osteoarthritis. She cuts the anterior cruciate ligament and this is the proteoglycan layer, this orange layer, and it prevents bone from rubbing on bone. And after you cut the ligament, you get 
bone rubbing on bone, and that causes the pain and loss of joint function. But if we treat these animals with downcyclovir, they not only can we prevent this if we're fast enough, but even if we wait up to five weeks, the cells eventually begin to rebuild that proteoglycan layer, and they will start to use that limb just as well as the sham treated animal. And so this is kind of very uh, encouraging that there may be some diseases that might actually experience reversal if we are able to eliminate uh, senescent cells. Okay, so I wanna now just talk one little bit about DNA damage and certain types of DNA damage. And this is a collaboration with Jan Vij and Jan Grimacher's lab. They study a mouse model of premature aging called ERCC1 deficient mice. This is a gene that codes for a protein that is involved in transcription coupled repair. So remember the polymerase, RNA polymerase, travels with repair machinery and that repair then will help eliminate blocks that would ordinarily cause transcription to stall. So in the absence of ERCC1, and, and there's a defect in this, this protein, um, the animals age prematurely and they develop um, senescent cells. This is the skin of these animals. Same thing is true in human cells. We take human skin fibroblasts. If we knock down ERCC1 due to um, uh, SHRNA, um, they will eventually begin to accumulate senescent cells. Now, what was surprising, this work was done primarily by Claire Kim, who's now working at Genentech, is the cells became senescent and then they began to die. We actually never see this with radiation. We treat with even high doses of radiation, the cells pretty much stably arrest. But in the absence of ERCC1, the cells senesce and then they die. And what Claire was able to show, whoops, sorry, is that um, this cell death um, that she sees in the absence of ERCC1 is largely due to the fact that over time, again, emphasizing the dynamic nature of the cells, the cells begin to accumulate very high levels of TNF alpha. And what TNF alpha then does is it kills the target cell. So it kills its own cell, but it also kills neighboring cells. And we think this is the real problem with the ERCC1 negative mouse. We also see this in the skin of the mouse. And what we see is a marked depletion of stem cells within the mouse skin. I should point out, we did cross our 3MR transgene to the ERCC1 deficient uh, mouse. And we did not rescue the pro-aging phenotype. And we think the reason is we waited too long, that if you wait long enough, these cells will eventually begin to kill themselves and kill neighboring cells. So again, another wrinkle that we need to think about. But the idea is, is that when there's damage, especially damage of the type that radiation causes, there's a secretory phenotype, there are cell autonomous and cell non-autonomous effects and that these together can drive aging phenotypes and pathologies. Now, the other thing I want to emphasize, and this was also emphasized earlier, is that for the most part, the immune system tries to control the number of senescent cells. And so our argument is that evolution selected for the transient presence of senescent cells so they could repair tissues or optimize embryogenesis or induce labor. But what happens with age is these cells become persistent, maybe because of a decline in the mean function, but also maybe because the SASP itself changes over time and now can no longer efficiently uh, recruit the correct uh, immune cells for elimination. So of course, what we all wanna do is go out now and become transgenic and take our gancyclovir so that we don't age. And of course we can't do that. So you heard now from uh, 
in the earlier speakers that um, there are drugs that are being developed. There are now really many dozens. I think Dao Hong has done some of the most extensive work in identifying drugs that are senolytic, that is selectively kill senescent cells, or senomorphic, which are drugs that can selectively suppress certain modules of the secretory phenotype. Uh, our bias is that we should be working a little bit more with senolytics because you don't need to have constant pressure from these drugs. That is, they kill, then you can take the drug away. And of course, only slowly over time will senescent cells reappear. Whereas senomorphics, you usually need constant pressure from the drug. But both of them have shown to be useful in different types of, of diseases. So here is really where we are and where we need to go. To my knowledge, we still don't know enough about the senolytic and senomorphic drugs. None of them, to my knowledge, are efficacious against all senescent cells. That might be good because we know some of them are beneficial, but we need to understand the dynamics and the differences in order for us to be able to develop these drugs in a way that they can be more pointed. One of my biggest fears is that at some point, some company is gonna run a clinical trial and there's gonna be a really bad side effect, sort of what happened with gene therapy and it's going to set the whole field back by 10 years. So I think we need to be cautious in applying these drugs to people, even though there are phase one and even now a phase two clinical trial that's going on. Um, the other point I do want to make is that um, we really need to have more basic scientists understand these processes so that we can inform of the many companies that are actually going to do something useful, like develop a, a drug that we can all take. Um, again, reminding you that some senescent cells are beneficial. We don't want to get rid of them. Um, I've actually advised some companies that they should be developing antidotes to every senolytic that they develop. Um, because what happens if you take your senolytic and you're in a car accident and you have massive injuries? <laughs> we don't want the senolytic to be preventing tissue repair. And I can tell you right now that suggestion has never gone over very well. And then the important thing to remember is this incredible, remarkable plasticity uh, of the SAS. So I think that these drugs, senolytics and senomorphics, are definitely on the horizon. They're going to be available to us, I think all of us in this audience. And I think they do hold promise for extending our health span, for certainly treating certain types of diseases or certain types of aging phenotypes and pathologies. Now, of course, what everyone wants to know is Will I live longer? Well, especially the guys in Silicon Valley, they really want to know, will I live longer? And I think this data, these data were shown to you by Del Hong. This is from Jan van Dersen's paper in which these are two strains of mice. And he treated these mice either with a vehicle or with um, his senolytic, which is a different killer, but still it eliminated senescent cells over the course of much of their uh, middle age to old age. And what you can see is this very impressive increase in median lifespan. And in fact, many of the age-related diseases that we examined um, were either ameliorated or postponed or even in some cases reversed. But you will notice there's really no difference in maximum lifespan. So you can be depressed, you can say, well, Okay, we're stuck with our species specific lifespan or something else is killing these animals. We need to figure out what it is and then we're gonna get a mouse that will live for 25 years. I I'm a little skeptical about the second possibility and it has to do with the history of lifespan extension. We can extend dramatically the, the maximum lifespan of certain species. So C. elegans, the world record is tenfold. But if you go to a slightly more complex organism like this Othola, uh, the record is less than twofold. And if you go to a mouse, well, 
it's pretty paltry. I mean, it's, it, I don't think it's ever, well, it has never reached twofold. And I think what evolution might be telling us is that setting species specific lifespan, which is something we still do not understand, required changing so many different genes that we may not be successful, at least in the near future, of finding a drug or even a cocktail of drugs that can mimic what evolution can do. But what we can look forward to, I think, is living healthier lives. And then I'll just end with this wonderful quote from Thurgood Marshall. Uh, he was the first black Supreme Court justice in the United States, 1960. Lifetime appointment, someone asked him how long he plans to live. And his response was, I plan to die at 110 from a bullet wound from a jealous husband. So maybe we can ascribe to that. And then I just want to thank the many people in the lab, many of whom have recently left the lab, um, past lab members with whom we still collaborate, and a fantastic group of collaborators without whom none of this work would have been possible. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Judy, so very much. That was just excellent. That was just excellent. Thank you so much. I mean, that was, I wish you could hear the, uh, the applause. <laughs> that was just really wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we do have time for a few questions. So um, I, I will go ahead and, and we'll just work through some of those. The first one comes from Dao Hong. Uh, Judy, thank you for an excellent talk. Here, here, that's so true. I was wondering if the timing of similar therapy has an important impact on the outcome of the one-two punch cancer therapy because senescent cells may be needed to stimulate tissue repair and anti-tumor immunity shortly after irradiation and chemotherapy. Yeah, that's a, that's a terrific question and an important question. And yes, I think timing will be important. And we don't know the correct timing because on the one hand, we do want to help the normal cells recover and repair. On the other hand, we also want to call that immune system in to start eliminating those senescent cells. And so I think the timing may be quite critical and much more work is needed to sort that out, I think. Yes, and I, I think to your comments about how, you know, once a, a pathology is already developed, you know, it's, it's too late. The senolytics aren't really helpful. That's correct, that's right. Yes. And so, and the synolytics too, I mean, they're just fascinating and so much promise um, to them, both to cancer therapy and to, to aging. Um, I know another one of our questions is, you know, well, what can you comment on the reversibility or the escape from cellular senescence, um, especially therapy induced senescence, for example? Um, I think a cell, especially a cancer cell that became senescent in response to therapy is certainly better than a cell that didn't senesce and will continue to run, no question. But the danger of reversal is, is real. And that worries me a lot. And this is why I think senolysis might be a more rational way of treating those cancers. Remember, a cell became senescent because it was stressed or damaged. And to reverse that phenotype, you're now getting stressed or damaged cells to begin to proliferate, which I think might not be to the benefit of the organism. And so I, I'm really much more in favor of working out the timing better and then just getting rid of all senescent cells once we're sure that those uh, cancer cells. You know, Zhao Hong also pointed out that some senolytics are failed anti-cancer drugs. And I should point out, if you want to cure cancer, you have to kill every cancer cell. You just can't have cancer cells hanging around. Whereas from the mouse models, we know you do not have to kill every senescent cell in order to get health benefits. So generally around 70 to 80% killing is usually enough, which is why those anti-cancer drugs work as senolytics, but not necessarily 
hundred percent the same to cancer drugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. We'll go on. We have quite a few questions. Um, and you might, if, even after, if we have to stop early, Judy, you might even want to look at the chat and, and the question box if you'd like to respond to any of those. Um, we also have a question about how do you know senescent cells are not abundant, that they're only a few percent? If they have no senescent specific markers, um, how can you tell how many senescent cells there are in a tissue? Yeah, that's another good question. So what you can do, and this has been done, not just by us, but by many labs. So let's say you induce, you, you radiate a tissue, and now you look for SA beta gal positive cells. And there are, you know, 3% SA beta gal positive cells. Okay, but how do you know that there are not another 3% or more P16 positive cells? So then what you want to do is you want to stain the P16 or P21, or HMGB1, um, or even some of the cytokines. And we and others have done those studies. And the good news is that many of the senescence markers do track with each other. That is, they tend not to be totally independent. They can be, it's not either or, but they tend to track with each other. And still, even when you add up all those markers. I think John Sedeby had the world's record. He looked at the skin of old baboons that were baking in the Texas sun for most of their life. And I think the most he saw was 10 or 12% senescent cells using multiple markers. Mm. Yeah. So I guess, again, you know, the, just the point that we, we need a lot more work on what actually identifies senescent cells. And, and the other point I should make is that when you treat an animal, and at least so far, humans, the little studies that have been done in humans with a senolytic, it's not like you experience severe tissue atrophy. So if there were many senescent cells, you ex it would expect the tissue to shrink. Well, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. We'll move on to another question. Again, great talk, Dr. Campisi. Since you also mentioned that the SASP is different, not only in different organs, but also in different cells coming from the same organ, do you think developing tissue or cell-specific targeted senolytics would be more beneficial? Yes, I do. Absolutely. <laughs> I should tell you right now, we're making a new version of our mouse in which we're, got, we're engineering in a way to make it tissue-specific. So we can at least test in a mouse, you know, what happens if you eliminate only senescent endothelial cells or only senescent etin, uh, retinal cells? Or, so I, I think that will be the next wave of, of discoveries. Yes, yeah. And, and, and here's an interesting comment too. It kind of follows up on, um, you know, that because senescence suffers from limited numbers of biomarkers, how can the radiation community help in this regard? Is there anything that you see that um, some of our radiation studies might be able to help with identifying new biomarkers? Actually, yes. So some of you may know that the NIH, the NIH common, so this is not specific to NIA, it's NIH, has recently issued a call for proposal to uh, identify senescent cells in a variety of tissues over the course of a variety of ages. And so I don't know how many centers are being funded. They've just completed the review. So our center will be funded, but it's so much work. Each center is only focusing on a few tissues. But if you go to the NIH Commons, you'll be able to see who was funded and what tissues they're funded. And if you have tissue from irradiated patients, I know that those the PIs of those projects will be thrilled um, because we want to look not only across the age spectrum, but also across the spectrum of therapies. So that would be fantastic. Yes, and kind of related to that, we have a question about you know, not only age and all of that, but what about um, sex? Is there any um, indication that the number of senescent cells might vary by sex or, you know, respond differently to some of these treatments? Yes, that's great. I can tell you right now, we have very preliminary data 
to suggest that the nature of the sass may depend on sex, or at least I should say sex steroid hormones um, that can influence how the sass is, what the actual nature of the sass is. So, so that means also in women, for example, pre and postmenopausal women may have different sasks. Yes, which is also interesting. I mean, it tied even to, you know, as you were pointing out, pregnancy and, and lactation and all those things that are, I mean, who knows? <laughs> There's a lot of differences there. Very good. Well, thank you, Judy. Again, I, we've hit most of the, the questions and we've run out of time so that people can, can hop on to our next series of, of symposia. But it's been such a pleasure and just an honor to have you here with us today. So thank you so much. And so great to share the, the podium with great speakers in the beginning. Thank it, you. And the symposium was wonderful as well. So thank you all for that. And thank you to the audience for some great questions. And I just encourage you now to go ahead and head on to our next series of symposium. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.